Okay, anyway, let's go ahead and get started with today's lecture. Um, we didn't end up finishing the material from last week because I ha uh, had you guys do an activity where you guys explored some of the patterns that you get whenever you're looking at uh, powers in modular arithmetic. So in today's class, we're going to formalize some of those patterns that we found, and we're going to culminate in what's called Fermat's Little Theorem, which is one particular way of understanding the um, powers in any prime modulus. And it's going to be super useful whenever you're dealing with um, really, really large powers in prime moduli, because it'll allow you to very quickly compute it without doing even the uh, binary um, thing that we did last time of breaking things up into powers of two. Oh, so let's remind ourselves what we did last time. So, uh, well, we considered arithmetic mod seven and mod 12. And then we looked at the powers of say one, two, three, four, five, and six in these tables. And we saw some patterns. Uh, for example, we saw the pattern of, uh, let's see, all these ones here, or the fact that you can get zeros down here. You saw repetition. You saw a lot of different things uh, when you were doing these prime powers. And so now the question is, of course, how many of these are things that you can generalize to all numbers? And that's going to be the subject of today's uh, lecture, which is going to, we're going to prove some of them. So what did we do? We finished last time by proving that powers always repeat. And this is just by using the pigeonhole principle, other than the fact that there are only n numbers in mod n arithmetic, but an infinite number of powers. So of course, at some point, you're going to have to repeat yourself. Well, today, we're going to prove a couple more patterns. Uh, and then in the second half of the lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about pi, because happy pi day, everyone. Um, but yeah, so, but first, we're going to prove some things, and then we'll see how much time we have left at the end of the lecture. So the patterns for today, do you always get one as a power of a non-zero number? Now, if you look at the previous chart, you, you might be like, well, it seems like one is really often a power of a non-zero number, but is it always? Uh, if not, when do you and when don't you? When can you not get zero as a power of a non-zero number? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, so these are our basic questions, and that's what we're going to try to go through today. And so because we now are going to be talking about proofs, we're going to walk through them a little bit carefully. Um, so now the whole point of a proof is just it's some logical chain of reasoning that allows you to get from step A to step Z uh, with connections along the way that all are logical and make sense. So I'm going to make a claim, which is that uh, if X is not equal to zero, then X to the K is equivalent to one for some K not equal to zero. Okay? So, Whenever you have a proof, you normally uh, start by saying what you're trying to prove. That isn't part of the proof. It's just like saying what you're trying to prove. And then you need to come up, uh, start uh, by noting, seeing what you know. So for example, uh, oh, sorry. So what's our proof? So that was our claim. And now we're going to start our proof. So the first thing is we proved last time that modular powers always repeat. Modular powers uh, actually. Uh, sure, let me use red. Always repeat. Okay, so that, that was one of our starting, the things we already know, right? So whenever you're proving stuff, you can start with anything you already know from other stuff we've done in this class. Um, and so one thing that we know from last time is modular powers always repeat. Plus, we know that x to the i is equivalent to x to the j for some x, oh, sorry, for some i not equal to j. What are we saying here? Well, this is just rewriting. Um, I'm sorry, let me grab my other set of notes because this set cuts off some of them. Yeah. So this is really just rewriting some of the, uh, the statement above. If modular powers always repeat, that, uh, if modular powers always repeat, then that means that there has to be some index i and j, two different powers that are equal to each other. Otherwise you couldn't repeat, right? Oh, there's a question. On the exam or quiz, are we writing proofs or will we be given to you? So you should take a look at the practice exam, uh, practice quiz two, or sorry, practice quiz four, which is available. What I'll do is I'll give you a proof and then you're going to have to tell me whether it's right or wrong and whether all the steps make sense. So I'm not going to expect you to come up with proofs from, um, from nothing uh, because that's uh, something that would, that's a little bit harder, but you will need to, I will ask you to understand proofs and see what's uh, going wrong and going right. Okay, but anyway, so we rewrote modular powers always repeat in this sort of mathematical form. X to the i is equivalent to x to j for some i not equal to j. 
obviously if i is equal to j then these two have to be the same um well then we know that one is equivalent to x to the j minus i and so if we just let k equal to j minus i then that's not equal to zero right so we now have x to the k is equivalent to the one for some k not equal to zero. And that concludes our proof. How does everyone feel about that? Ah, so everyone, so people feel okay about that. Well, what if I told you well, that's actually wrong? Something in there went horribly wrong. Um, and let me let me point out that something went wrong, which is if you go look back at um, our powers, if you look at the, the powers of uh, say four, with the powers of four, you don't ever end up getting, uh, other than the zero power, which we're not counting for this purpose, you don't ever end up getting a one right here, right? So something went wrong. We, we proved something that's not true. So if you prove something that's not true, you know that you must have made a mistake somewhere. Um, so now the next question is, well, where did I make this mistake? So was it in this step? Was it in this step? Was it in this step? Or was it uh, in say list step? And um, I'm gonna say E is uh, proof is correct. Something went wrong. And I'm going to ask you what it is. So now what you have to do is you have to go back and look at each of the steps and ask yourself, did that make sense? Am I allowed to do that? Actually, I've already told you that it is wrong. So let me go ahead and separate out the yeah, so I've already told you it's wrong. Oh, why is this not uh, there? Okay. So the third line say, uh, oh, the third line says that one is equivalent to the x to the j minus i. Okay, so people are thinking that it might be the, the third line. Why? Does someone want to say in chat or just out loud? Why do you think the third line is wrong? Add powers. Um, I don't quite know what you mean by that. So um, certainly it doesn't have, to, it cannot equal one. Ah, okay, so what, what is that third line trying to say? The third line is trying to say that, well, normally if you have X to the J, that's equivalent to X, uh, uh, sorry, is equal to x to the i, uh, is equal to x to the i, x to the i is equal to x to the j. You can, of course, divide by x to the i on both sides, and you get uh, x to the zero is equal to x to the j minus i. But what was the key word I used there? No, uh, not the word equal. I only use the very few words, so you can keep on guessing. So let me re re repeat that. Oh, yep. So divide. Division is the key here, because we don't know how to divide in general necessarily. So the answer to this is we cannot divide in general. Remember, we went to all this trouble to figure out when you are allowed to divide and when you're not allowed to divide. And so uh, in that particular, in that, oh, sorry, this is this step here. Uh, I could have wrote it in the wrong place. So cannot divide in general. And in order to get that, you would have had to divide by x to the i. So we, we can uh, uh, adapt this proof to make it correct. So what would you need for this, to be, this proof to be correct? So the problem here is we can't always divide. So when could you, when would this proof be correct? Well, when can you always divide? 
exactly when the mod is prime or 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 you uh, when it's co-prime so when you have two things that are relatively prime uh, but in general this proof is correct if n is a prime number Okay, so let's step C only works. Um, or sorry, not only works, but let's say this works. Works if N is prime, may not otherwise. Okay, and this sort of makes sense, right? Because in the previous case, we had a counter example, right? But the counter example was when n is equal to 12. And so when n is not prime, things can go wrong. But when n is prime, uh, you always do get one as a power of uh, every single number um, greater than zero. Okay, so there was some amount of confusion there. How much of that has been resolved and how much are you all still pretty confused about what's going on? Okay, still some amount of confusion, but uh, let's keep on going. So uh, basically to recap a little bit, whenever you're doing a mathematical proof, you have your claim. So what you're trying to prove and the very last uh, sentence of your proof is usually either repeating your claim or like just saying that you've now proven your original claim. But then you need to have some chain of steps and each of those steps, you can ask yourself, is this correct or is this incorrect? And that's how you know that the proof is correct. If every single step of a proof is correct, then that means the proof as a whole is correct. Um, there's an entire art to figuring out what steps you need to do, which we're not going to cover in this class. And often there are multiple different proofs that are all correct, as well as multiple different proofs that are all incorrect. So um, on next week's quiz, one of the things I've done is I have, well, since I had to write five different versions of uh, the quiz, so there are five different proofs, all very similar, uh, some of which might be correct and some of which might be wrong, but all in slightly different ways. Let's try something else. So uh, powers in prime moduli not equal to zero. So I'm going to now I'm going to make a claim. Let x be not equal to zero and let p be a prime number. Then my claim is x to the m is not equivalent to zero mod p for any m greater than zero. Okay, so that's our claim, and now we're going to prove it. And whenever you start a proof, you need to ask yourself, well, what pieces do I have? Um, and in this particular case, um, I don't really have that many pieces to start off with, but for this proof, I'm going to do it as a proof by contradiction. So what do we mean by that? That means we're going to assume that uh, the end, we're going to assume that things are not the way uh, the uh, theorem wants, and then we're gonna see if we can find that it creates something nonsensical. So, right, so a proof by contradiction is, I want to prove that A implies B. And so then in the proof by contradiction, then I assume that whatever you're trying to prove is not the case. And then you show that uh, weird stuff happens. So we're going to suppose, would you be able to explain what each step means? Um, yeah, do you want me to go back and explain what each step means in the previous uh, slide? Or do you want me to do it for this one? Or I can do it for both. Um, let me go through this proof first, and then I'll go back, and then I'll go through each of these proofs uh, carefully, step by step again. Okay, so here I'm going to start with an, with a proof. Of contradiction. So suppose suppose for contradiction that x to the m is equivalent to zero for some m greater than zero. Okay, so. Note that we always have the starting point. So let x be not equal to zero and p is equal to prime, a prime. Okay. So we already know that. Uh, I think I meant to have not equivalent to zero there, but anyway. So we already know that. So that's what we're given. And then we're going to suppose for contradiction that this is not true. So let's just do the, the basic setup. Whenever you're doing a proof by contradiction, it's going to take that sort of form. You're going to suppose that the conclusion is false. So the conclusion here is x is not equal to zero or not equivalent to zero. We're going to assume that's false. And if that is false, then that means that x is equivalent to zero. 
So uh, that's our normal setup of proof by contradiction. And then the next step, well, if x is if actually m is not equivalent to zero for some m greater than zero, then there must be some smallest value, right? So maybe this happens multiple times. Maybe x to the 10 is equivalent to zero and x to the 20 is equivalent to zero. But clearly there's some smallest number in any set. Okay, so if I give you 10 numbers, I can ask you what's the smallest of those numbers. So we can assume that m is the smallest value, smallest value such that x to the m is equivalent to zero. Okay, because it might happen multiple times. What else do we know? We also know that x to the k is equivalent to one for some k greater than zero. Why do we know that? Why should it not be surprising that x to the k is equivalent to one for some other k greater than zero? Yeah, so this has to do with the repeating, but it's not, that's not actually quite enough. Um, it actually has to do with what we proved on the last slide, uh, right? Because the whole point of the last slide is that we proved that if m is a, if n is a prime number, if we're in the prime modulus, then there is some x to the k that's equivalent to one. So once you've proven the theorem in mathematics, you can reuse it in any later theorem. So that's sort of one of the points of mathematics is uh, even if someone proved the theorem 2000 years ago, we can still use that. And in fact, we do still use that. And so we already proved it. So we can just use that as uh, take that for granted now. So because P is prime and we're in a, mod, a prime modulus, there must be some X to K that's equivalent to one. Okay, but now uh, if, let's say M is less than K. Okay, so we, we have some k, uh, we know it can't be equal to m, right? Because if it, if it was equal to m, then that would say that one is equivalent to zero, which doesn't make sense. So what if it, m is less than k? So there are two cases. One is when m is less than k, and the other is when m is greater than k. So let's start with the case where m is less than k. So this is case one. If m is less than k, then we know that x to the k is equivalent to x to the m times x to the k minus m, right? Because now we're in a prime modulus and so you can actually do division. And so you can actually use the standard power rules and do subtraction and addition, right? But we know that x to the k, um, well, we know actually m is equal to zero, right? So this is equal to zero times x to the k minus m which is equivalent to zero. But now this is a contradiction because we knew that X to the K is equivalent to one. And now we're suddenly saying, well, well, X to the K is also equivalent to zero. So now we've shown that there's a contradiction for case one. <coughs> Excuse me. But now we, we also need to consider the other case, right? So what if M is greater than K? If M is greater than K, then all powers less than or equal to K are non-zero, right? Because we assume that M was the smallest one for which this was true. But we know that the powers repeat. Powers repeat after X to the K. And so our first k things were non-zero, but then they just repeat. So that means that uh, after they repeat, they still have to be non-zero and you can't ever get a zero out of it. So there isn't a zero afterwards, a zero afterwards. Euler, which is also a contradiction.
And since we've now shown contradiction in both of the cases, that proves the claim. Plus, uh, we've proven the claim. Proven the claim by contradiction. Because both of those cases were ones where uh, you had a contradiction. So you need to make sure that there's all, if you're trying to do a proof by contradiction and you have multiple cases, you need to make sure that there's always a contradiction in all the cases. Okay, so let's do this again. Where did things go wrong? Uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm just copying down my places. Or do you think it's correct? Um, that's also a possibility. So you need to go through it one by one, each step, and then ask yourself, is that, does that state step make sense? So is the setup correct? Is this a correct proof by contradiction? Um, is it fine if you, uh, to use previous theorems, which is what we're doing in B, uh, if, Ah, so people are thinking it might be in C. So what are we doing in C? Well, we're basically breaking up a power into two different pieces. Can we break up a power into two different pieces? So why do people think that, uh, so we have a lot of people voting for C and D. Why do people think that it might be C? Oh, just don't understand it. Okay, well, let me rewrite C uh, a little bit. So C is basically saying x to the fifth is equal to x to the squared times x cubed. That's all we're doing there. We're breaking up the number into two numbers. What about, uh, uh, sorry, let me put that in the box. What about the people who thought that it might be D? Why do people think that it might be D? So the argument for D is a little bit complicated, right? Because what we're saying is that, uh, because we're making use of several different ideas. One is that you know that things repeat. And the other is, well, if you've reached the, if you've reached the entire cycle, and you don't have any zeros there, then there can't be any zeros further along. And that turns out to also be correct. And so the answer here is that this is actually a correct proof. So this proof actually is correct. Um, and you, what you have to do is you have to carefully examine each of the steps and ask yourself, does this step make sense? And in order to do that, well, you do need to understand what's going on in each of these steps. And there are lots of different ways for you to try to figure out um, for a, a, a step to be correct. So steps can be correct because they're a, a correct setup or say a proof by contradiction. Steps can be correct when you're uh, making, doing some manipulation. So you're multiplying both sides by uh, X squared or something like that. Proofs can be correct because you're using that step to find a contradiction. So even though you're finding things that are nonsensical, sometimes that's what you mean to happen when you're doing a proof by contradiction. And maybe the last step can be correct because uh, uh, if your conclusion, if all the other steps were correct, that uh, were, uh, were along that chain. Okay, and that's the basic idea behind these sorts of proofs. And on the quiz, I'm going to ask you to do something quite similar. So uh, it will be a simpler proof than this. So these are a little bit more sophisticated than the proofs that you're going to see, but they're going to be of the same style as the proofs you're going to see on like the quiz and perhaps the final, uh, is I'm going to give you a list of steps and then I'm going to ask you, is each of these steps correct? And then you're going to have to justify why you think it's correct or why it isn't. Why in step C does it equal zero? Well, that's a really good question. Why does that equal zero? That equals zero because we know x to the m, we supposed for contradiction, but x to the m was equivalent to zero. And so we replaced x to the m with zero. 
but zero times anything is just equal to zero. So let's go back to the previous slide again, just so that we can, uh, um, just so I'm spending a little bit more time on this. On the previous slide, we again looked at each of these individual steps. So this was a different kind of proof because we didn't do a proof by contradiction. We just did a direct proof. So we initially started with, oh, well, we already proved previously that all modulus of powers repeat. Um, so then what we did is then we set it up so that we had two different, we set things equal and then we subtract, we did a division. But that was the thing that we made a mistake on. We couldn't divide in general unless things were prime. But each of all of those steps are just uh, uh, computations after that. And so that, that was a direct proof instead of an, uh, a proof by contradiction. And there are even more complicated proof uh, strategies. There's also proof by induction, which um, I'm probably not, I don't know if I'm going to cover that. It's certainly not going to be on the next quiz. So uh, on the next quiz, the only proofs that you will get are either proofs by contradiction or these direct proofs. Um, but in all, each of these, you just need to follow each chain of logic and ask yourself, does, does anything in this chain of logic not follow from the previous lines? Okay, any questions about that? Take a look at the practice quiz. Uh, it'll be of a similar format. I, I already put the answer key up, so you can stare at like what, what I sort of expect from you in terms of justifying whether a step is correct or not. If the proof is correct, how do we, oh, that's a really good point. If our proof is correct, how do we explain that's correct? Do we use examples? So this is very important. If a proof is incorrect, so if it's not correct, you can, you can figure out that's not correct by just finding a counter example. Um, of course, for the purpose of the quiz, I'm going to ask you to still explain what part of the proof is incorrect. But in general, as a mathematician, uh, if someone gives you a proof, showing that the proof is correct is really hard because you need to check every single one of the steps and then ask yourself, is every one of the steps correct? So your proof is not correct. If you just provide one single counter example, then that means the proof must be wrong. You don't know where in the proof it's wrong though. Uh, so it's not super helpful in trying to fix the proof, but it just will, will tell you that things are wrong. So how do you explain that's correct? Well, you explain that each step is correct. So in step one, you'll be like, well, this step works correctly because that's just the property of modular arithmetic. This step works correctly because uh, what we're doing is this is the setup for a proof by contradiction. So in each step, when you write something down, when I write something down, you need to tell me why I'm allowed to write it. And if I'm not allowed to write it, well, then maybe the proof is incorrect. Any questions about all that? Can you explain D again? Ah, so D is a little bit complicated. Um, but the basic idea of D is suppose I have a repeating pattern. Oh, ah, go away. Suppose, ah, okay, I can't write there. Uh, suppose I had some repeating pattern in one, three, five, seven, one. Okay. So if I had a pattern one, three, five, seven, one, and I said that it was repeating, then what you get is you get three, five, seven, one, three, five, seven, one, and so on, right? But if you have a repeating pattern like that, um, then you can't ever get a zero somewhere down here, right? Because then it wouldn't be part of the repeating pattern. Well, that's basically what step D is. But yeah, so another way of thinking about this is that you're making an argument, but you're making a justified argument. So every time I make, I draw, I make, make an argument, I need to justify my statement. I need to explain why what I'm saying is right. And so, and the thing about mathematical proof is it's a very, very fragile argument in the way. So normally if you're arguing with a friend and they're like, oh, no, no, you're wrong about, uh, uh, let's say I want to tell a friend that, oh, let's go uh, get bubble tea down on Lawrence Padina. Um, and then someone's like, oh, well, you, you can't get bubble tea at Lawrence Spadina because that particular bubble tea place plays both. And that might be correct, but even, and so I might be wrong about that, but that doesn't mean that my entire argument, we should go get bubble tea is wrong. But the mathematical proof is a lot more fragile than that. If there's a mistake anywhere in the mathematical proof, it is no longer valid. And so that's what we have to do when we are working as mathematicians is you have to check really carefully if each of your steps is correct. <laughs> Thank you.
there is really good bubble tea on Blur and Spadina, for the record, um, if you guys haven't been downtown there. Um, okay. So having said that, let's keep on going. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, one of the, um, oh, I'm totally going to run out of time. I'm not going to get to my Pi Day lecture, am I? Well, that's all right. Uh, I'll talk about Pi on Wednesday, I guess. Um, but anyway, let's keep on going. And oh, come on, why am I not able to switch? And we're going to talk about Fermat's little theorem. So this is a really, really cool theorem. And it'll also make your computations much easier. So like I was saying uh, at the very beginning of class, a lot of what mathematicians do is they come up with the easier shortcuts to do really hard computations. <laughs> but now one of the things you might have noticed is that if you're in a prime modulus, all those answers are one, right? Now, a little bit ago, we proved that you always do get a one when you're in a prime modulus and then things repeat. But the question is, when do they repeat? Sorry, there's a little insect, a little gnat that's flying around. So if you see me waving at it, that's because it's, uh, getting in like my hair. Um, but yeah, so this is Fermat's little theorem, which is that if P is a prime, then X to the P minus one is always equal to one. Well, mod P, uh, assuming that X is not equal to zero. Zero to any power is zero, uh, so. And uh, another way of writing it is that for any X, including zero, you can say that X to the P is equivalent to X mod P which is a really cool kind of result, right? Because this allows you to uh, say uh, things about um, powers, uh, a, a power that's just equal to zero immediately without needing to actually go through your tables. So uh, for example, uh, five to the 12 mod 13, since 13 is prime, is equivalent to one. Seven to the 17 mod 17 is equivalent to seven. Okay, so you can immediately use Fermat's little theorem to tell you to get the answer to some of the sum power. And this is true, but, um, and uh, we'll go through the proof idea, though I'm not, I'm not going to go through it super rigorously since this proof is a little bit more sophisticated than the ones we were just doing a moment ago. So the proof idea, you know, well, remember we had the beanbag tossing experiment, which we did in the other room a couple of weeks ago, um, where you showed that for any prime modulus P, the multiples of any non-zero number X are all the numbers, right? Because the whole point was that everyone gets the beanbag whenever you're tossing it around in the circle, uh, if the two numbers are co-prime. And I'm oh, sorry, are relatively prime. I don't think I defined co-prime in this class. But yeah, so uh, if the two numbers are relatively prime, and of course, a prime number is relatively prime to everything else. Uh, so as a quick example, in mod seven, multiples of two are all different numbers, all, all the non-zero numbers, um, all the, I'm oh, sorry, not even non-zero non numbers, just all the numbers. So you had two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, but of course that's just one, that's just three, that's just five, and that's just seven. And so, so you get all the, uh, wait, did I? I totally messed it up, didn't I? One, oh, no, 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 I didn't. Seven. Seven is zero. So that's correct. Okay. Okay, so that was the beanbag tossing experiment, uh, and where you look at multiples in mod P. Well, now we write the multiples, we write X in P to minus one different ways. So remember, again, we're in a prime modulus, so you can do division. And so I can write any number X as X over one, right? X divided by one is still X. 2x divided by 2 is still x. 3x divided by 3 is still x, and so on. Uh, so as a quick example, 2 is equivalent to 2 divided by 1 is equivalent to 4 divided by 2 is equivalent to 6 divided by 3 is equivalent to 12 divided by 6 mod 7. But of course, 12 here is just 5. So 5 divided by 6 mod 7 is also equivalent to 2. Okay, so this is because we showed that we can do division. When you're working in a modular arithmetic, you, uh, you can do division if the modulus is prime. Well, then what happens if you multiply all these together? Well, you notice that we have P minus one copies of X there, right? And so if I multiply together, each of these P minus one the copies written slightly different ways, you end up getting one, two, three through P minus one on the bottom and 
x, 2x, 3x, uh, p minus 1x on top. But both of these happen to be all the non zero numbers. Zero numbers exactly once. What do we mean by that? So an example is two to the six is equivalent to two times four times six times, well, times eight, but eight is just one times three times five divided by one times two times three times four times five times six. And that all together is equivalent to one mod seven because everything exactly cancels out. I'm getting a couple quizzical looks. Ah, so why is 12 divided by six five? No, sorry, 12 divided by six is not five. Um, 12 divided by six is also five divided by six because 12 is equivalent to five. And so that's a key here, right? So we have all these different numbers. So uh, this is also uh, 12 divided by six is also five divided by six, which is what we have down here, five divided by six. So the whole key here is that when you're being that tossing experiment, which seemed at first like just a silly game that I made you guys play, what you end up concluding is that you get every single number. And in fact, another thing that you might notice is that uh, it takes you exactly p tosses to get back to your starting point. So if your starting point was zero, if you did exactly p minus one tosses, you get to every single item without repeating. And you wouldn't, you, you, you wouldn't uh, do your starting point. And so if you rewrite this uh, this way, what you show is that both the top and bottom are all the non-zero numbers. And so therefore they all cancel out. And so you get exactly one for X to the P minus one. And this turns out to be super helpful. Um, although first I'm going to do a brief history interlude since I've enjoyed doing that. So remember, modular arithmetic was invented by Carl Friedrich Gauss in 1801. When was Fermat's little theorem developed? So the thing we just proved is Fermat's little theorem. When do people think it was? Okay, so people think it will happen pretty uh, shortly after people invented modular arithmetic. Sorry. Um, well, oh, sorry. Yeah. So it turns out that the answer, uh, and Pierre de Fermat was, Fermat was the one who actually uh, did this. It turns out that the answer is it was proven in 1640 AD. So the answer is actually A. People proved, for, well, Fermat uh, had Fermat's little theorem even before people invented modular arithmetic. How is that the case? Well, you might be asking, how can you prove something about something you haven't invented? Well, the answer to that is you can often rewrite theorems in several different ways. So I've written it in this way, x to the p minus one is equivalent to one mod p. But you don't need to write it that way. You can also write it as a statement in just ordinary numbers. x to the p um, minus one minus one is divisible by p. So those two statements are the same because uh, and so what Fermat proved was basically saying that if you take x to the p minus one power for any prime p and then subtract that by one, then that's divisible by p, which is entirely equivalent to a statement of modular arithmetic, but without that sort of formula. So sometimes you can prove things even before you've invented the right language for writing down what you want to say. You just have to write it in a slightly longer way. I guess I'm, uh, yeah. So let's keep on going. So what's the point of all this? So I've been giving you these esoteric theorems and the reason for that is this makes computation easier. So if you guys have looked at the ungraded uh, problems for this week, as well as the uh, practice goes for next week, you might notice that I, I have you do some powers and you can always do powers using the sort of uh, way of breaking it up into powers of two. But sometimes that requires you to deal with really big powers of two, and that's a little bit painful. But with Fermat's little theorem, it turns out that you can basically take large powers, uh, you can reduce large powers by division 
uh, to their remainder. So what do we mean by that? So if we let n be equal to uh, m times p minus one plus r, then x to the n is equivalent to x to the r mod p. That's a lot of that's a lot of algebra. Let's give an example, and then hopefully it should become a little bit more clear. So example, eleven to the fifty-five mod by t. So we actually did this one in class. So this is one of the ones we did in class. I made you guys write out all the different uh, powers of. I gave you the powers of two. You broke up uh, 55 into a sum of 32 plus 16 plus and plus so on. Um, and that allowed you to figure it out. So you could do it this way. 11 to the 55 is equivalent to 11 to the 32 times 11 to the 16 times 11 to the 4 times 11 squared times 11 mod 19. This is painful. I mean, it's less painful than writing that one by one, but it's still a little bit painful, right? It turns out you can do it even faster. So alternately, you also know that uh, 11 to the 18 is equivalent to 1 mod 19, right? So this is Fermat's little theorem. You immediately know that 11 to the 18 is equivalent to 1. Well, if that's the case, well, what happens if you divide 55 by 18? If you divide 55 by 18, well, you get 3, and that's 54, remainder 1, right? So, you know, 11 to the 55 is equal to 11 to the 18 times 3 plus 1. Uh, sorry, equivalent mod 19, which is equivalent to 18, oh, sorry, not 18, 11, which is equivalent to 11 to the uh, 18 times 3 times 11, which is equivalent to, well, what's 11 to the 18? Well, 11 to the 18 is just 1. So it's equivalent to one cubed times 11, which is equivalent to 11 mod 19. Yes, this way is a lot easier. So now you might be asking, why did I make you guys learn the really complicated hard way of doing uh, all the powers of two? Well, the answer to that is you do sometimes still need to do it because this only allows you to reduce everything down to smaller than p minus one. You still need to figure out what the power of it is within p minus one. And so for that, you still do need to break, you still sometimes do need to break it up into powers of two. But now that I've given you this faster method, uh, let's try it out. So let me zero out the chat. And uh, looks like most of you are finished writing. So what is 6 to the 363 mod 11? And I'm definitely not going to get to my Pi Day lecture. That's a little bit sad, but oh well. Okay, I'm getting a couple of different answers. So let's try solving this together. So notice that we're working in mod 11. So what we, that means is that we know six to the 10 is equivalent to one mod 11, right? So if six to the 10 is equivalent to one mod 11, then that means that every group of six to the 10, you can just reduce out as a one. So well, what's 363 divided by 10? Well, 363 divided by 10, that's pretty easy. That's going to get you 36 remainder 3, right? So that means that 6 to the 363 is equivalent to 6 to the 36 times 10 plus 1, which is equivalent to 6 to the, oh, sorry, plus 3, which is equivalent to 6 cubed mod 11. So what's 6 cubed mod 11? Well, 6 cubed mod 11 is equal to 36 times 6, which is equivalent to, well, that's mod 11, so that's 3 times 6, which is equivalent to 18 
which is equivalent to seven mod 11. So the answer here is seven. I'm not sure how people got six. Uh, could someone who got, since a lot of people got six, could you mention what you did differently there than what I did? So one thing that you need to be careful about is when you're doing this division, normally when you're doing mod 11 division, you divide by 11, right? But when you're canceling out powers, you divide by one of the uh, modulus minus one. So you divide by this 10 here instead of by 11. Okay, anyway, let's try another one. And hopefully, I uh, remember when you're first break, when you're breaking up the powers, you need to break it up by groups of 12, not by groups of 13. And at the very end, you need to do mod 13. And so there is some mix of uh, uh, division by 12 and a mix of division by 13. How does 36 become 3? Oh, because 36 is equivalent to 3 mod 11, right? Because 33 is equivalent to zero. This is one of the keys. Remember, we said that you couldn't just take mod. Okay, well, I guess that is a fire alarm. Um, so with that, I guess. That will be an early end to the lesson. Um, and we'll finish up on Wednesday, I guess. <laughs> what? Uh, I mean, class ends in three minutes. So, yeah, so we have to go outside. Yes. Yeah, so it is a fire. So please go. Yes, please don't die. <laughs>